Next up is the argument from the scale of the universe. So, in short, the argument is universe big, therefore no god. So that's basically what they. I mean, no, I mean, I can mm. probably try to steel man it. I mean, I I see this on atheist meme pages all the time, and it's it's basically like you know like is they're talking about the size of the universe and how it's like so implausible that uh, you know God would create this just to have a relationship with you or something like that. Um, so if I were to steel man this argument. If we look at the universe, it is so overwhelmingly vast, and it's mostly lifeless and barren, and just devoid of things of value. It's just mostly uninteresting stuff, you know? And similarly with, like, time. I mean, it's only, in terms of, like, cosmological history, um, we've only gotten, like, things of value, like valenced conscious states, states of pleasure and pain and whatnot, um... We've only gotten that for the past, like, maybe hundreds of millions of years. And, you know, the universe has been here for at least 13.8 billion years ago. And maybe that was preceded by, like, a big crunch or something like that. I mean, in terms of, like, the, the temporal span of the universe and the spatial span of the universe, like, it seems to be mostly full of, like, barren, valueless, lifeless stuff. And so the, the thought behind the argument, and this is my just steel man of it, is that, well, if God creates a universe, as theists think he has done... Like, we'd expect it, it seems, to be brimming with things of value, uh, since that's just, like, that's much more valuable than a universe that isn't brimming with things of value. Um, but a mostly lifeless and barren universe is the opposite of that, right? So the universe that we have is the complete opposite of what we'd expect under theism. And by contrast, it's much more expected if God doesn't exist and fundamental reality just doesn't care about producing things of value. Uh, if, if there are going to be things of value under such a view, then they're going to be very, you know, very tiny portions. Uh, it's, or at least it seems more likely that they're just going to be very tiny specks in all of the barren, lifeless wasteland of, of reality. And so then uh, the thought is, is that the size of the universe, the scale of the universe, and the insignificance, the seeming insignificance of things of value within the universe is evidence against God's existence because it's much more surprising on the hypothesis that God exists than it is on the hypothesis, than a competing like naturalistic hypothesis. So that's my steel man of this argument. Um, I'll turn it over to you. I mean, you're, you're just sort of smiling and laughing as if to suggest that you can't even take it very seriously. I must say, I, I was talking about this the other day to, with, with, with somebody or other about the sort of... I mean, I've, I've been I've been arguing with people a lot recently, or, or talking a lot about the decline of the significance of propositional arguments, like what I was just saying in in the existence of in the question of God's existence. Like people are much more interested at the moment, it seems, in the cultural uh, space, in like narrative and politics and this kind of stuff. The sort of analytic philosophy arguments of God's existence has fallen out of favor a bit, and part of the reason for that is because there is something that you can't quite capture in a syllogism about like thinking about the size of the universe watching one of those videos where it like zooms out into the earth and the solar system and, and you talked about time like 13.8 billion years of past god knows how much future it, including after you know human beings could like destroy themselves with a bunch of nukes probably not on like a religious picture of divine intervention but like such as such a big expanse of time I mean, famously the the analogy people give if if just in case people aren't aware of this i mean you talked about how we've been here for a few hundred th uh, million years in terms of like conscious agents and the universe has been here for billion years people often can't get a grip on the difference between millions and billions the famous example is that a million seconds is 12 days a billion seconds do you know how long it is show a billion seconds it's like 37 years or something it's 31 years, 31 <laughs> years versus 12 days for the difference between a million and a billion. Like it's unfathomable. And, and even then it's quite difficult to really wrap your head around just how long the universe has been here. And just kind of like what? So that like, I mean, the, the, the joke is like, oh, and all of that so that God can tell you not to masturbate. You know, like it's like, it's funny. It's a good stand up bit, but it does also capture something which like when I see that video or I see that sort of scale comparison of how tiny we are in these huge galactic expanses like it does leave me thinking like man there's something just wrong with the idea that we're what it's all about and could i put it into a syllogism like maybe like you just kind of did you sort of steal me you can come up with a way of putting it, but it doesn't quite capture it's like trying to take a poem and like explain what it means in non-poetic terms you can do it and it can help people to understand like what the poem's getting at but there's something captured by just hearing the poem and there's something captured by just thinking about the universe it's just like i don't know man so it's got this like emotive power that i think is is quite strong but you, you, you're right that like as a syllogistic argument it's you could just meme upon it like oh well like the universe is big 
premise to if God existed, the universe wouldn't be so big. Therefore, God doesn't exist. Like, yeah, man, like great argument. Yeah, it's sort of yeah, fair enough. But it it's got something to it, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, so I think that's an interesting point, and it goes. It's similar to what at least a number of theists say about God's existence. You know, it's like. Just like, look at the trees, man. Like, it's fall. Just like, seriously, look exactly. at the trees. And you're just struck with like, ah, the awe and the beauty of creation. Okay, like, you know, put this in an argument. Premise one, trees. Look at the trees. It's premise two, <laughs> if look at the trees. Okay. Like, God exists. Conclusion, God exists. Look, I mean, fair enough. Like, yeah. Fair enough. But, 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 but having said that, I think there's like, you, you know, the sort of like the, the, the bell curve IQ thing. And there's sort of, a, it's like a bit of a meme format. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of like... um the the bell curve of intelligence and it's like messy desk at one end clean desk in the middle and then messy desk again at the high end right so i think yes. there's something like that going on with like you know no idea of like philosophy or theology like but god must exist because of the trees and then it's sort of like curves up into you know the Kalam cosmological argument and contingency arguments and then it just circles right back around to it at the, at the heights of intelligence no 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 like yeah look at the trees man just look at the bloody trees god exists you know yes. there's like a version of yeah. it that when properly thought out and considered and appreciated for what it is like it kind of does work man like you you look at the universe you look at the trees you look at the world and you think man this is awesome this is beautiful and it sort of gives you this feeling that you can't put in a syllogism interestingly that often happens for people looking at the universe like the same person who looks at this huge galaxy and says, we mean nothing, looks at this galaxy and thinks, wow, this is amazing. The the heavens declare the glory of God. So there's, I guess, that sort of symmetrical pull that might sort of undermine the atheistic quality of this consideration. Yeah. And those kind of like, I guess we could call it sort of like direct insight or like alleged direct insight or some maybe it's just yeah. like an intuition. Like you just you look at the trees and it just strikes you that God exists upon, you know, the it occasions that intuition in you or something like that. And similarly with the size of the universe, it can occasion that intuition inside of you. I mean, I sometimes think I have this sort of intuition when I read about some like the most particularly horrific instances of evil. So if like I'm reading about some of the things that happened in, for instance, Auschwitz, I get this distinctive sense that like, oh man, like no perfectly loving being could allow that this sort of thing to happen. Um, or like, um, what is it like? Uh, Junko Furuta or whatever it is. I forget her name. Um, but like, it's like one of the worst crimes in like the history of humanity. Uh, like this, per this, uh, this Japanese girl, I think was basically like tortured for like many dozens of days and it's, it's atrocious. And when I, mm. when I read that, I'm like, I, I, when I listen to the descriptions of what, what occurred, um, I just get this distinctive, like poignant sense that like, man, like clearly there's no God, you know, like th that sort of thing. And, you know, sometimes I get a different sense when I'm looking at like the, uh, the profound, machinery inside the cell. I actually minored in biology when I went to Purdue. And, you know, like some of this microbiology stuff is just so overwhelmingly, insanely complex and ordered and beautiful. And it's it's incredible. So like, I don't know, I get these competing senses. Uh, and mm. it's hard to, it's hard to like put stock in one of them as opposed to the, some of the others. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, just in terms of this argument, what are some of my thoughts? Um, I guess if I were a theist, I mean, like maybe, this may very well be like evidence that like we aren't the only thing that God is interested in when God is creating. But that doesn't mean that, that God doesn't exist. It just means that we're not the only thing that God is interested in. God has maybe has aesthetic reasons for a very large and mostly lifeless universe. I mean, you know, like you look at the pictures from the Hubble telescope and that they're pretty stunning. Um, and maybe like a vast diversity of things, some of which are lifeless, some of which are like gigantic planets, some of which are just like tiny particles in interstellar space, some of which are life forms. Maybe like this vast diversity of things better reflects God's goodness. You know, like Aquinas uh, famously said that um, like God created a, a vast diversity of things because no particular thing could adequately reflect his goodness that he kind of eminently contains. So a, a vast diversity of things better reflects different aspects of the divine character and, and God's goodness and so on. And finally, I guess... Maybe there's maybe like a large and mostly lifeless universe is required in order for the universe itself to be able to produce life. You know, like life is a very seemingly rare and precarious kind of thing. And maybe there is some value in the universe itself kind of cooperating with God to bring about these sorts of valuable results, like the existence of, of conscious life. And so it would make mm -hmm. sense that God would then create uh, like a gigantic universe because it's like making it more likely that their like, life would come about in, in some small portions of it through the universe's own kind of means. So I don't know. There, there are a lot of different yeah. responses to this kind of, kind of argument. It, it's, also, it's also worth considering um, that 
Well, for for a start, I mean, like like you say, the universe seems to be necessary to for for some areas of life. Like, I mean, famously, the heavier elements are forged in supernovae. Supernovae. How do you how do you say the plural there? Supernovae. Supernovae. Supernova. Whatever. That's man. how I pronounce it. Supernovas. You know, fine. Um, the big the big stars collapsing or whatever. Like that's where we come from. And, and not only is there sort of beauty in that, like awesome, great. Um, it's it's also like okay, maybe you just need these huge like clusters of of exploding stars in order to create the carbon that makes up most of our bodies and it just so happens that yeah why not make them really beautiful as well cool like awesome um sure maybe but it does seem to me like there's nothing in principle stopping god from just like poofing carbon into existence he seemed to manage to do that with like hydrogen so why not or at least with subatomic particles but also it is worth considering i think this universe big thing there will have been a time when you know all human beings were consigned to wherever they were living in africa like ethiopia or something and if somebody had brought them a picture of the planet earth and said look at the size of the earth you're on they might have said gosh there can't be a god because like look at all this wasted space look at all of this land mass that's just completely empty except for a few like wild animals that don't even like have a moral conscience like I don't know, like this is totally ridiculous why would god create this huge massive earth and like consign us all to ethiopia and someone could say yeah well we could go over there it's like oh yeah yeah we're just gonna we're just gonna like walk across the ocean like to like wherever the hell this like antarctica looking thing is like yeah sure man like good luck with that and then you know you fast forward a couple of hundred thousand years and look at us go man we've even made it to the moon um of course you know light years of distance is a bit of a bigger challenge but like a lot of people are hopeful about wormholes and galactic expansion and all that kind of stuff and maybe we're just at the beginning of some like exponential growth of humanity across the stars and if that's the case the universe will begin to feel a lot smaller um and depending on just how exponential and just how long we're talking i mean a billion years from now we might have made it quite far if we're still alive. 20 billion years? 50 billion years? I mean, like, man, we're talking about a long, long time. We're talking, like, orders of magnitude more time, possibly, than, like, the difference between, like, an amoeba in the ocean and a fully developed human being. So the universe could be full of surprises. I just think that's worth also bearing in mind. Yeah, now time for ranking it. So, I mean, preliminary thoughts. Preliminary thoughts for me is that... um it's not it's not a terribly good argument in my view. Uh it's not <laughs> I feel like it's not as bad as the stone paradox. The so stone. if we put the stone paradox in E, even though I think maybe it should go in F. Uh if we put that in E, I think I'm inclined to put this in D. I was thinking the same, especially because it has that opposite pull of people do look at the universe and think how beautiful God must exist, you know, universe big, therefore God, universe big, therefore no God. They both sort of do something for people. Yeah. And so maybe, maybe, maybe you're right that the rock one should have been an F and this should be an E, but like E and D, it definitely should be above the, the rock one. Like it, yeah, it, yeah. it should obviously be above the rock one, right? So yes, yes. Probably <laughs> D tier. I mean, we can, yeah. we can revise this at the end if we need, but I think at least for now, like D tier seems like a good place to put it. Yeah. Sounds good.